Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, first order of business is approval of the minutes. Second. Okay, any discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Carries. The next item on our agenda is the public comment. Do we have anyone signed in for public comment? Okay, anybody from the public wish to speak at this point on an agenda item? Seeing none, we'll move, uh, close out public comment and we'll go right into our first presentation. That is the Performance, Classification, and Compensation Initiatives with Ms. Dara uh, Schenever. Excellent. <laughs> that is absolutely the perfect friend for them today. Thank you. Welcome. Well, good morning. And uh, we are here this morning to provide an overview of the interrelationship between all of you, performance, classification, and compensation initiatives. So, as an overview, can you hear me now? <laughs> as an overview to these initiatives, there are six major tenets associated with uh, interweaving all of our pay for performance, compensation, and classification methodologies. First is the creation of an agency performance dashboard, which you will receive further amplification on from. Uh, our CFO, Mr. Jeff Seward, on November, is it 19? Second. Second. Thank you. Uh, the second tenet is operational metrics, or those key performance indicators that will flow from the establishment of the agency performance dashboard. The next is to link those uh, performance management competencies to the identified KPIs. The next tenet is the availability and existence currently of our NeoGov electronic performance management platform. We are currently in the midst of a very extensive classification compensation and total rewards study uh, that will be completed by close of the calendar year uh, to be reviewed uh, towards rollout in the first quarter of 2016. And finally, the pay for performance, which is a huge initiative that is going to change clearly the way we've currently uh, assessed performance and uh, conferred any monetary benefit. At uh, the top of the leaderboard is the agency performance dashboard and KPIs. Um, what this is designed to do is to show a continuous strategy um, where the mission and the vision and the strategic goals and objectives of the organization are continuously cascaded through four primary portals of financial health, customer service, um, uh, establishing our integral business partners, and also learning and development, which is also a very critical component. <coughs> Next, of course, is to link those performance management competencies to the KPIs that we have uh, identified um, based on the agency performance dashboard as we roll through the implementation of that initiative. With the NeoGov electronic performance management platform, otherwise known as PERFORM, we can link that platform through our applicant tracking system, which is also uh, the NeoGov model. And what this does is essentially gives us continuous evaluation of performance throughout the year. The platform is essentially a two-way functionality, meaning that not only are supervisors and managers managing uh, competencies and performance, but the employees also have feedback and self-input on their development and uh, career objectives. Now, the compensation study was kicked off in August of this year by um, the Siegel Waters Consulting Firm out of Washington, D.C. Um, they are doing a very comprehensive total comp study, which is going to include, amongst other deliverables, the uh, updated job descriptions for our current jobs, 
so that all of the current duties and responsibilities are clearly articulated. This study will also benchmark HART against peer agencies throughout the country. Ten peer agencies have signed on to complete a very comprehensive benchmarking study in the form of the classification and compensation models they follow. And this study will provide to us recommendations regarding potential changes to our classification system, our total rewards, our executive compensation, and our pay for performance strategies. And of course, um, undergirding that is the last deliverable for that compensation study, which is to evaluate and recommend based upon the peer information we receive from the benchmarking where we want to live in terms of a pay for performance strategy that is best suited to accomplishing the objectives for the agency. Now, in implementing any pay for performance model, of course, there's a high degree of change management, which means that we have to scope every step of the implement implementation of the process. Um, so we're going to go through an organizational readiness uh, to determine if, if we've implemented correctly. And that starts by appreciating and understanding the organizational culture, training our supervisors, doing the rollout of the model for performance evaluation, actually establishing a budget uh, for purposes of the pay for performance model, um, obviously creating a sense of fairness and transparency with relation to the process, also training and continuous training and evaluation uh, for both our managers and our employees, and finally constant system re-evaluation to ensure that we are accurately and clearly uh, implementing a new process. The supporting components that are not represented here, um, we wanted to give you a full view, but not overwhelming, so, um, are several key um, factors that are part of these initiatives. One, of course, is onboarding and doing that effectively. Um, we will be rolling out some additional initiatives with respect to the way that we do talent acquisition and onboarding uh, to include changes to our pre-employment testing and other methodologies designed uh, to support our employer of choice um, vision uh, by Ms. Egan. Also leadership development. We've um, actually evaluated and probably intend to follow a leadership development partnership with the University of South Florida as part of their organizational development leadership program, which is a capstone course. Also, we've started our succession planning in earnest so that we will avoid those things such as the brain drain and the knowledge deficit by getting a handle on knowledge transfer before we lose valuable talent. And finally, implementing a total reward strategy um, that includes all of the components, not just compensation, uh, but in addition, engagement and other methodologies um, towards a total rewards package. Now, for the dates of the initiative rollouts, we rolled out the talent acquisition um, platform, which is our NeoGov Insight on board, in November of 14. Next came our performance evaluation platform also through NeoGov, which we implemented in full in March of this year. The next steps are, of course, the succession planning, the ODL leadership, the delivery of the deliverables on the compensation study, uh, finalizing the performance dashboard, and then establishing a pay for performance methodology which will be on the ground and moving forward for our FY17 fiscal year. And with that, I'm done. If there are any questions, I'd love to entertain them. Okay, thank you very much for that uh, very thank thorough you. presentation. Are there any uh, comments from board members? Uh, Director I, I just want to say A plus on the presentation. It was brief, but it was informative. The slides went over well. It was, it was a fantastic presentation. Thank I you. Really appreciate it. I appreciate that, thank you. And I have to say that this was a cross-functional effort between all of us, making sure that we got the information to you in the best possible format, so we thank you for that. Thank you. Okay, and, uh,
Uh, yes, I'd just like to uh, say the same thing. Beautiful presentation. Just want to add to that uh, our most valuable resources are our employees, as you pointed out, with the compensation package and that kind of thing. And uh, a lot of evaluation has a lot to do with uh, uh, assessments. But one thing I want us to be very careful about is that as we begin to shift, especially when it comes to benefits and et cetera, that we don't, we're not shifting burden to our employees to save otherwise. I, I think we need to be very careful as we look at that so we can preserve those uh, valuable assets and, and so that the morale of the uh, uh, workers are, are always kept, uh, kept up. At the pinnacle. Absolutely. And I think that's one of Ms. Egan's uh, major concerns as well. I know it's something she takes very seriously. Um, and that is probably evidenced as best with the employee satisfaction survey that we did in October of last year um, that was really intended to get a pulse on our change agility and our ability to move forward as an organization as we matriculate into the transportation agency of choice, uh, the change agent, the employer of choice. And I think those results continue to resonate in our minds so that we know we've got a baseline on the data for engaging our employees. And I think we fully plan to do it again, potentially after a two year cycle. So thank you. Uh, yes, very nice job. Thank you, thank you. Um, on a, on a side note, um, I, I well, I don't necessarily want more details right here unless you know off the top of your head. I'm curious to know a little bit more about the capstone part of it yes. when you get into that. Yes. Um, and in regards to the pay for performance, is that in, is, there, is it a combination between merit and pay for performance or how are we going to do that? We're still formulating the strategy that's going to be best suited for the agency based upon the objective measurement of the KPIs. But most certainly, it will be premised on performance. And to the extent that any merit is actually included, I think that there will be some kind of level of percentage gradation related to the other metric, which would be the objective performance, whether your KPIs and your competencies were met overall. On the other question with respect to the capstone course, this is a new program that USF is rolling out starting in February of 2016. 2016. And this is a certificate course. Uh, it's a capstone course. Dr. Ed Whitnail is the person who will be conferring the certification. Um, it's a very intensive uh, program with approximately 11 modules. Um, and so we will be part of what appears to be the fledgling class uh, where the graduates will matriculate through and graduate in roughly June of 2016 so we're quite excited about that uh, are is this solely for part or are there going to be other entities that will be included in this there are and that's the beauty of it there are other entities that are included um, because of our partnership and our relationship with usf we were one of the first um, that were engaged in the dialogue i sit with usf members on the hr thought leaders panel um, so they came to us and said, we've got a wonderful proposal, and we're going to roll this out to our other business partners uh, in the Tampa Bay area. So this was a great initiative. Thank you. Thank you. It's Dr. Shannon. Good morning. Good morning. Sorry I missed your opening, but I was at the Hart Building <laughs> looking for the meeting. <laughs> So my apologies for being a couple Not a late. problem, thank you. Um, I think it's, first of all, it's an excellent outline in terms of an agenda and a plan and a strategy, which I think is the first of sort of educating the employees about this adaptation to both measurement and reward. I think it's also important to, you know, as we talk about this, continue to remind everybody, this is taxpayer money. Taxpayer money should go into services as well as a good institution with strong employees with a good you know good morale and everything else that everybody said. But you also you can get into a cycle where there's an expectation of everything's going to go to what I call a recurring promotion. 
irrespective of performance. And I think that that is the culture that we're now both addressing and trying to make sure that we're rewarding the right behaviors on an annualized basis in terms of really distinctively rewarding that behavior. So that it's not just a 1% over the norm, it's a significant you know, uh, commendation for behaviors that affect the efficiency and um, I would say you know, respect to the agency. I just, you didn't mention anywhere from a compensation, usually you include health care, your pension program, I mean, everything is in. So every year they get an annualized report. And I know somebody mentioned that earlier that they are getting an annualized report. I think it was Michael a couple of meetings ago. Um, that that is part of a reward, you know. So some people don't necessarily want cash right now. They might want, you know, some, they might be options that they would rather have it later in a pension program. And I think that it's important to, as you talk about this around the organization, because it is change, is to make sure that all component parts of compensation are involved in both the study, the report, the diagnostics, as well as the communications to the team members. Uh, Director Shanahan, thank you so much, and I'm glad that you brought that up. Um, that was what we aspired to obtain, was with the compensation study that we're doing with Siegel's, um, consulting is to help us formulate a big vision of our total rewards philosophy and that comes from not just compensation it comes not just from incentivizing performance or measuring it objectively we have tuition reimbursement we have health care benefits on multi levels and tiers as you recall we have um, deferred compensation we have uh, the Florida retirement system there is a commensurate with that review the necessity for us to develop that philosophy so that it becomes part of the total compensation package. Right. So excellent point. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate you. your presentation. Okay, moving on, we um, have a couple of committee <coughs> action items. Um, the first one is a uh, increase in the not to exceed on a um, uh, contract that I think we approved in July. And um, I had asked that we uh, pull this, this item and, and discuss before we consider entertaining the motion. Um, did, uh, is this, oh, I see Al Burns right there. Maybe you could give us a little presentation on, on what this is about. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the committee. <clears throat> As you know, in July we passed, um, the board passed a resolution for a contract VC386 to Ash Construction. We were in the process, in, in passing that resolution, it, enco it encompassed five different areas that Ash would be working on. They were de to develop several scopes of work, one being for the agent building renovation, um, see, excuse me, the utility services for the stormwater, and about three other ancillary projects. When doing so, they they eliminated they eliminated themselves from being able to compete as an A and E firm or on the construction side of the house. We we, we issued them notice to proceed approximately a month or two ago, and they have started mobilization as far as doing their due diligence of the H and building uh, and various other heart facilities. In doing so, we were in a couple of meetings. And the idea of design build versus your traditional construction method, which is design bid, bid build, was um, vetted at the table. Um, to be honest with you, Madam Chair, it was me that said, hey, design build method is the way that the agency should go. But there was, there was rationale behind me for, for selecting that method. As I stated before, Ash had been given um, a contract I think it was approximately $173,000 for those five different levels of effort. But the one for this writing the scope of work in the independent cost estimate for the HM building was approximately $42,000. Now shifting from design from design bid bill to design. Excuse me, 42 was the heavy maintenance um, yes, initial part of the original contract. Yes, ma'am. So, Switching from design bid build to design build, in my opinion, it, it allows us a lot of different, op a lot more options. One, it streamlines um, the procurement process, which also cuts down on the time frame. Cost containment, 
And what I mean by that is, with the CNG, um, with the CNG implementation, we went with the design build method as well, and that project was approximately 5.1. That project came in, uh, came in on time and on budget. The reason we went with design build was be because staff wasn't equipped to write the specifications needed for that. So that's the same approach that we're looking looking at with this project is a design build um, approach rather than your versus your design bid bill approach. Also streamlining. Streamlining is very important. Staff is very thin from a project from a project management perspective. And us being able to streamline the process going from rather than going from project manager to A and E to prime contractor, we're able to go from project manager directly to the design build um, company that we hire. So coupled with that, um, I took all those things under evaluation and I said, hey, I think the most prudent thing for us to do is for us to move forward with the ash construction. Now, there are a couple of things that influence that from a monetary standpoint. And I think if you look, generally speaking, the cost for design on a construction project runs from anywhere from 8 to 10%. 8% on $4.1 million is approximately $325,000. So I looked at that along with, we would, still need, we would still need to have someone write the specifications to hire an A&E firm to do the, exact, do the exact same thing that Ash Construction is, is offering for us. <clears throat> also, I'd like to speak on Ash's qualifications. Ash has been a partner with Hart here for, I want to say, maybe about a year and a half. They've been awarded not only this contract, but other contracts before. Now, I know, you know me, I'm, I'm a procurement professional, and um, competition is something that I, that I stand by. But when I, when I took all these things in consideration, I was like, okay, should we move forward with Ash, or shouldn't we? And then I thought back to the contract, the overarching contract, VC386, and I said, hey, let's look back at these records and let's see how many people actually proposed all that. Two firms proposed. And once again, um, I apologize for the redundancy, but the reason that only two firms, whether it be general contractor or A&E firm, um, proposed was because they didn't want to eliminate themselves from the competition. The big, the big the big ticket items, the HM building renovation, which is 4.1, the stormwater renovation, which, which, excuse me, the um, stormwater assessment, which we don't know. Once we start digging, we don't know uh, what the magnitude of that project is going to look like. So once again, I, I, I looked at all those things and I said, hey, we want to get this project moving forward. We want to get it moving forward expeditiously, but we want to get it moving forward correctly and with it, with, in accordance with um, policies and procedures. With all those things, I thought that bringing, I thought bringing it to you this morning was a prudent, prudent thing to do. Lastly, um, Ash's qualifications, they're extremely qualified. They've done um, approximately $32 million worth of construction efforts at USF, um, doing the design build method. And then they also um, did a project at St. Pete College for approximately $1.2 million. On that project, they were the only um, contractor. They, des they did the design build, design build criteria package to, to be led. At USF, they partnered. They, they partnered with a company called KPI. That's their, sub that's their subcontractor who has the architectural experience in the, in, as part of their portfolio. Um, all these things, Madam Chair, is what made me um, talk to Ms. Egan and Jeff Seward and, and advance this to the committee this morning. Um, yeah, I, a couple questions, and I appreciate that because you did answer a lot of them, and I, I really uh, do believe design build is, is the way to go, you know, in the future rather than design bid build. Um, and so I don't have a problem with that. Um, the increase in cost, is that primarily due to the um, are, are they going to be doing the 30% design plans then for the um, for when we let out the construction phase? Is, it, is that what's because you you mentioned um, or of the hundred and it's roughly 150 
uh, in Upscope, how much of that is going to be due to the um, going from design bid build to design bid build? <laughs> a very, very good question. And I will tell you that ASH is committed to bringing us up to 30% design, which is normal in design build effort. 30% 30, 30 design is, is what's required and, right. and, and is the expectation. Additionally, they're going to hold our hand through the whole process. When we did the, I wanted to, I wanted to package this the same way that we did with the CNG building or the CNG facility. Parsons break off, they were there holding our hand when we did when we didn't know what questions to ask. They were asking the, they were asking the questions for us. Ash um, says it's, is the same thing inside their proposal that that after it is awarded the design bill contractor is awarded, they're not going to just say okay. You have it, it's awarded, and walk away from us. They're going to stick with us the whole way. And if we have any questions um, in regard to the chillers, to the HVAC units, um, regarding to the storm, excuse me, to the water flow at the facility, all these elements are critical. And with Ash also being here on the ground, working these efforts already, and getting all the background information, it just makes them um, the most qualified. In short, yes, the 142 extra. We'll go to them, but if you look at it from the from a big picture standpoint, we still come out ahead um, in approximately one hundred and fifty thousand dollars by going with Ash versus going out and hiring another company to write these specifications for us. Well, this this is where this is where I have an issue. Um, so what I'm hearing is most of this upscope is doing the design. When we ran this by the committee in May, and um, it came before us, I questioned the fact that only two firms had actually bid on this. And the answer that I got as to why only two firms were um, out there is because it did not go through the um, professional services solicitation. Um, unlike what I see in today's packet, we sent out a, a, a bid notice to 94 A&E firms and that um, these two firms were selected um, earlier on due to their constructability. So there was no, uh, and, and I don't want to impugn any of the, the engineering firms that are involved, because I, I believe they're all very qualified. Um, but my, I guess I have a little bit of a problem with the process that we use, because now we're upping the scope to include design services that we really did not have an opportunity to, um, to analyze with other agencies. Am I, am I wrong there, or did we do, you know? No, ma'am, you're absolutely correct. Um, when we initially let the contract and we awarded the contract, um, the thought process was design, bid, bill. Design, bid, bill. Um, since, since then, I've, I've, myself and staff, <coughs> Um, thanks to Ms. Egan and Jeff, we've been allowed to go out to different different seminars and, and things of this nature, and we're learning about these these new processes. So, at the end of the day, yes, um, if we would have, I, can, I can't say for sure, but there, there is that unknown that if we would have um, started with a design build package versus a design build bid build package that we could have potentially got more competition if, if that's where you're going with that. Well, is there, and, and I understand we've hired them to do the statement of work and the cost estimates for the design and the construction for, for those five elements in the original contract. Just um, for the design, just for the designer. Uh, well, what I'm saying is, is there, could we put out for competitive bid the design portion to bring the plans up to 30% and keep the current um, contract in place, um, we may we may find that we get a lower bid. Just to make sure I understand the question correctly, um, you're saying that we could go out and hire a firm to put together the design build criteria package for the agency and bring us up to 30% design, just like Ash. Right. That's well. That's the that new element. Design bid build. That's what they're. They think. You know, he started out saying he did. He was doing a design bid build, which we, right. they would have then bid the design, and then and so they've decided based on the established relationship, the performance of Ash, the established relationship. There's a cost savings in here, potentially up to 150 thousand. That's what I'm hearing now say. Yes. To right. stick with the firm that they've hired to do the you know the the first response. Right. And your question is, would they get more competition if they went back out? Just the design portion. Well, that's that. You'd be going back to a design bid build then. 
Okay, so so we would not retain any of the value of doing a cost estimate and a statement of work. By well, you'd be changing project managers. It would just be. I mean, there's this, this is this whole you know uh, debate going on in the construction slash engineering space. Is design build or design bid build? And you have to evaluate, which is what Alice explained, that they decide they changed course from going from a design bid build to a design build because of the establishment of a strong relationship, strong performance, you know. And I would use it more as an owner's agent than holding your hand. I mean, you sort of you hire somebody that you feel like can take you through the whole process in a more efficient fashion. A lot of people do move from design, bid, build because it saves. Otherwise, you have to go through a whole bidding process. It's a very labor-intensive process to then do a very small portion of work, and at the same time, you know, a lot of people are holding back to get the big job, you know, which is actually the work once it's once it's designed. So, I mean. <coughs> I, I view this as an efficientizing, if you establish a good relationship with a credential contractor in your initial bid, your point is, is a good point. You might have had some more bidders if you'd started out design build versus design bid build, but um, I think that lesson has been, I would say, noted and hopefully learned. I, and I don't think right. you should say every time you're going to design build either. I think you sometimes get better work this way and I'm a contractor so I sort of get this game like every way but Sunday you know and my my question and listening to Al talk about it station process for um, these six different these six different areas that the contractor was um, that the contractor bid on a lot of times and I don't mean any disrespect to the handling community at all but a, but a lot of times it's better to get a contractor to help you write the scope of work for construction than an A and E for an A and E firm. Right. And, and what I mean by that is, is once the A and E firm gets puts the um, the design documents on, on my desk or on the satchel's desk for review, I look at it and and, and yes, over 20 years of, of doing this, yes, ma'am, I, I could look at the drawings and I could do an assessment. But more often than not, when I bring a um, a, co a construction contractor to do a constructability review on those designs, they find several flaws in them, and, and they're able to help us with that. And that's the val and that, that was more of the value that I was looking for than hiring your traditional A&E firm. Okay, sure. So I'll ask you, you know, the, the folks here that are, that are experts, but so essentially what you're suggesting is that by going with the design build, we have more of an opportunity for sort of the value engineering component of it rather than the design bid bill where you kind of have to iterate and pay a fee every time you iterate a design to, to value engineer it? Um, Director Carino, that, that's an excellent point. One, one of our CEO's mantras is innovation. And in bringing design bill to the table, that brings innovation to the table. When, when you hire RSW, Parsons Brinkerhoff, et cetera, you're going to get a standard set of plans, and when you bid that, it's done. It's done. When we're looking at from a design bill aspect, they're going to bring us. We'll already have a 30% design, which hard staff is going to weigh in heavily on. Then once you, then once we hire the contractor, they're going to bring us to 60, and we're going to weigh in on that, and the 90. So we're not stuck in this box. And the, the beauty of it, to, in my opinion, is no change work. Because, because they're, we're mitigating all risk, or they're mitigating all risk by doing a design build method. Yes, one can say that the price might be a little bit higher than if we did design bid build, but I would challenge someone, after you add up all the contract modifications, change orders and th everything like that, we'll come out way ahead doing a going with the design build method. So and that, that's, that's just my opinion. And, and if you look at, at the conference um, I went to, I think two weeks ago or last week or something like that. Um, that was one of the main main points of emphasis was that right there. So and so that that's always a judgment call, right? Because in, in the design build, you you can run into similar <coughs> problems like you know, I didn't expect to get that right, and you didn't know what you were going to get when you started the process. So so there are, there are risks in both, but I, I appreciate that what you're suggesting in the design build and the ability to, to save money, and the ability to value engineer it, and I like that part a lot. I kind of have to go back to Shanahan's point, which is 
it does feel a little bit like there was the potential for this contractor to kind of work their way in, generate a relationship, and then expand the scope and, and at some level avoid the competitive process where if we had originally come out of the gate as a design build, right, we probably would have had a good number of participants. So I guess my, my opinion when I kind of put all that in the soup is that I'm willing to trust sort of the team's professional judgment here and I think Ms. Shanahanik picked up a little subtext that you're generally comfortable with the way this went down this time. Um, if this was a multi-million dollar project, I would I would be saying we're going back out to bid because I don't think it's I mean it's a small enough number and I think there is there's a lot of this change in the dynamic of selection of the process and I and Al's presentation outlined to me that he had full integrity with his process from a procurement professional you know and I think that yes in this case I'm I'm going to be supportive of this I, I wouldn't say that I would be supportive if it was a much bigger amount of money okay very good Madam, Madam Chair I would like to say something and um, director Shanahan spoke to this this isn't the method this isn't the method that staff intends to use on every construction project some will if it's a cookie cutter it'll go design bid bill but this project right here is ADA accessibility whether or not we want to use a freight elevator or a person elevator, uh, whether or not we want to move my storage department on the second floor of the maintenance of the building down to the first floor. So, so there's so many, it's so dynamic that um, I think that it warranted design build. Now at the eboard renovation, we, we, that, that brings us here today, which I hope you guys will be pleased with when it's done. And I, I felt, hey, drop ceiling, installing some lights, painting, yes, that's design bid build all day. So, so I, I think you know me, know me, ma'am, and, and you guys know that, that I'm, I'm going to use the, my best judgment and also take into consideration that at the end of the day, it is taxpayer dollars that we are spending. Very good, and I, I and definitely, uh, any of my concerns have been cleared up, and I appreciate that. Um, I did want to go uh, further into one other area of this, and I'm sorry to belabor this, but... Um, Another portion of this was the stormwater improvements. And as I understand, part of um, the assessment done by the engineering firm um, made some notice, notice some deficiencies in our, our surface uh, water management system. Now that part right there, I'm not right. fluent. Well, so right. I, I, okay, you have I'd to. ask to defer to Mr. Thomas Jones. Our okay, very good. Person. I spoke with Thomas on Friday. And um, yes, um, Thomas, would you like to address the um, stormwater um, portion of this? Thank you. Welcome. Good morning, uh, Madam Chair, members of the board. Um, as we discussed on Friday, um, we're here request, requesting additional $9,000 as part of the, the larger contract modification. Um, the deficiencies that you were referring to were not identified as part of a stormwater assessment or engineering assessment. Uh, they were actually identified um, as part of a, a separate effort, um, which is related to the Hard Environmental Sustainability Management System. We have ongoing environmental permitting efforts for the last 10 months or so. Um, part of that was NPDES permitting. And as a part of the environmental sustainability management system, we have uh, regular environmental compliance audits. Um, during uh, some, some background work uh, related to the NPDES permit is where we uh, identify the deficiencies at the facility as it relates to stormwater infrastructure. Um, so I want to just be clear that, that those are two different things. However, uh, the deficiencies that we did identify do have the impact or do, do have the potential to negatively impact the pending stormwater engineering assessment that is coming further down the line. Um, so we kind of have a two-pronged thing here. We want to we want to do some housekeeping um, in, as it relates to current permitting efforts and then as well as it relates to the quality of the assessment when it does indeed happen. Um, I, there's a handout uh, that is, is basically an aerial view of uh, 21st Avenue facility. And real quick, I'd like to just kind of uh, briefly take you through the deficiencies uh, that, we've, that we've seen. Um, I'd also like to say that facilities maintenance staff has regularly maintained much of the stormwater infrastructure on an annual basis. However, these are areas that re require additional resources and in order to be remedied, and their performance really simply has declined as, as a function of time. 
Um, over time, the, the performance of the swells that we have on, on site, uh, they become overgrown, they become uh, overset, uh, oversaturated with sediment, and they just require maintenance and upkeep. Um, the easternmost swell, which is the, the red line that you see running on the eastern boundary, it runs north and south, uh, was observed to have excessive vegetation growth as well as sedimentation. Um, the swell storage volume has been substantially reduced and does not effectively promote stormwater flow southward. As we move southward, we, we kind of bend around the property and we uh, kind of transition from Hart property to City of Tampa property. Um, in that bend there is uh, some reinforced concrete pipes at the Southern Rose Turn. Those pipes have heavy sedimentation in them and need to be maintenance. The easement, which is the yellow area on the, on the map there, is owned by City of Tampa and it's not anything that we can actually do ourselves. However, um, we want to be in close contact with them and try to develop a plan for uh, servicing that area. That area uh, in particular has some, has some issues um, in just not even its, its maintenance, but just the way it's designed, period. Um, and actually, one of the outflows that we have in that area is flowing backwards, meaning that instead of water flowing off of our property into the easement, it's flowing back onto our property. So you can imagine how uh, that could be a major player in terms of the flooding that we see at 21st Avenue. Yes, ma'am. Can I just interrupt you there? Is that due to maintenance or is that due to a design flaw? I, I think it's some of both, to be honest with you. Um, <laughs> I don't think it's, and I'm not an engineer, let me say that, but I don't think it's particularly designed well, that, that easement. Um, again, there's water flowing back onto our property that should be flowing off of our property and, and, and out to the right way. Um, and, and then another part of it is... Some of that can be for the, I mean, these pipes, these RCP pipes have been in the ground for how long? 50 years, 60 years, there could be settling around that. There, I mean, this is work I do. So, right. I mean, I'm doing this in 30 states. So there's a lot of, you know, the sedimentation in the pipe, the same with the erosion around the pipe. And then it can cause... In this particular area that I'm talking about, hand. it's just a swell. There's mm -hmm. no piping. Mm -hmm. So the piping mm -hmm. is on our side. Our, our, our outfall falls mm -hmm. into the swell. Mm -hmm. But the swell is designed in such a way, or it's not maintenance in such a way, in which the water in the swell does not, it's not falling well, out, it's coming back. back. So that's the, obviously that's a problem. Um, so uh, we have three stormwater ponds on the property on the southern boundary. Um, you'll see those in red as well. Actually, there's only two on your area. The third got, got cut off, it's, it's very far east. And uh, although we have a, a contractor that does uh, some, some routine uh, vegetation maintenance, we're, we're just at a point now where we need to do some heavy duty maintenance in, that, in those areas. So essentially, uh, what, what we're asking is uh, approximately $9,000 for the ASH group uh, to provide technical assistance by preparing a statement of work that outlines the specific requirements and activities required of a contractor and an estimate of pro probable construction costs to remedy these items. Additionally, after the solicitation is released uh, for the desired services, ASH will provide uh, construction project management oversight for the duration of the project, which uh, to be honest with you, I, don't, I think we're talking maybe about a week's worth of work, maybe two weeks at, at the most, but it's not a, a very labor-intensive effort. Um, and, and that's to um, maintain the swells and maybe dredge out the stormwater ponds? Yes, okay. yes. And um, we anticipate uh, completing this prior to next year's rainy season starting in June. Again, ahead of the stormwater engineering assessment. Um, is there any, and, and I think there is, I think I, I think mentioned briefly on Friday, um, is the idea to maintain the stormwater, clean out the, um, the concrete pipe, remove all the sediment, cut back the brush, maybe remove some of the organics and some of the ponds, and then wait a period of time to see if we are still experiencing, this could be, and I don't think it is, but I mean, there's a possibility this could be the solution right there is the maintenance of, of these um, storm artists. I, I, I agree with that statement. I mean, I, I, I believe uh, much like you do, I think, um, that there are obviously some issues off-site um, that are contributing to the flooding at 21st Avenue. However, there are things that we can do um, that may be able to, to help remedy that situation as well. In terms of performance, I can't say if that, you know, if that's a 10% improvement or if that's a 25% improvement. But again, um, there's kind of two things driving this. Not only is it that aspect of it, but it's our own environmental uh, permitting efforts in terms of environmental compliance for MPDS. Right, and, and 
did you, um, I don't know that I asked this, do we have an ERP permit, an environmental resource permit with SWIFMA that would actually prescribe, um, you know, a semi-annual um, check off by an engineer of the proper operation and maintenance of our stormwater system? I, I believe the permit you're referring to is a, is a National Pollutant Discharge and Elimination System, NPDES permit, which we do not have currently. We're in the process of acquiring that. Okay. So we don't have one for the facility, but we're actually in the process of, of filing a notice of intent. Okay. Uh, we have a, a SWEEP, a Stormwater Pollution Prevention Plan, which is a part of that process. Right. And then once the permit is, is uh, issued to us, then we will have the terms of that permit, such as, I, I know Right off the bat, we're going to have to do um, sampling at our outfalls uh, in year two. Um, prior to year two, we'll, we won't have to do any analytical sampling. It's, vi it's visible emissions, so it's just a visual observation. However, we've already done background sampling so that we know um, if we have any issues and what we're dealing with uh, prior to uh, when we have to do it for, for permitting. Mm -hmm. um, so we're a little bit ahead of the game as far as that is concerned. And how long have you been with her? 13 months. I just want to commend you um, for you know taking on this issue, and, and I believe it was due to your efforts that you um, that we came to this point to understand that some of our stormwater um, systems are needed in maintenance and repair. And, and um, I just want to uh, thank you for these efforts and, um, and the job that you've done so far. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Are, are there any other questions of Thomas while we've got him up here? Okay. Um, thank you very much. Um, with that, I feel a lot more comfortable um, having vetted this agenda item. Um, is there any other discussion on it? Move approval. Second? Anyone second? Second. Okay. Any more discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Motion carried unanimously. Um, and then the second action item is um, another uh, engineering type um, involved effort. It is here. This is a contract. Okay, this is a two, uh, a three-year task order to um, work on environmental remediation required by the Post Bureau EPC. And um, were you here to present on that as well? Yes, ma'am. Historically, there have been six areas designated by environmental regulators at Hillsborough County Environmental Protection Commission as areas of concern at the 21st Avenue facility due to various environmental releases dating back to 1985. Two of these areas of concern have been closed and are no longer active, while four remain active at the present date and continue to have unresolved environmental impacts at the facility. We are here today requesting the approval of a contract that will be used to comply with the specifications of a consent agreement entered into by heart with the EPC as part of an ongoing enforcement case. Uh, as you can see on your map, there's a, there's a map there that delineates the three areas, AOC1, AOC2, and AOC3. And not to be confused, and I, I realized earlier I just said that there are four areas, but AOC1 has a sub area. It's called AOC1A. Um, but for all intents and purposes, EPC pretty much puts them together and considers it one area. Um, ALC 1, the activities to be conducted in this area include quarterly groundwater monitoring and reporting. However, since developing the statement of work and releasing a corresponding solicitation in May 2015, funding from the state has become available to execute these activities. When the contract value, however, when the contract value was determined, it was assumed that HART would continue to fund these efforts. That money will now be reallocated to AOC2, as this is our largest unknown of all three areas. Um, I'd like to say that AOC1 is part of the state petroleum fund, and therefore, because of that, uh, we have the ability to use uh, state funding to address the, the issues that we have there, and that's what we're going to do. Um, AOC2, the initial activities to be conducted in this area include groundwater and soil sampling to further delineate the extent of contamination. This may require several field mobilizations to successfully do and develop a conceptual site model. Once we have fully de delineated the contaminant plume, we will then begin to discuss remedial actions with EPC. 
Again, it is largely unknown what will be required of us in the future in this area. This is a huge question mark for us, and we are 100% uh, on the hook in terms of uh, financial responsibility for remedying the, the, the issues. AOC 3, all investigations have been completed for this area, and we've been issued a site rehabilitation completion order by Florida Department of Environmental Protection. At this point, we need to close that portion of the site out. To do so, we need to abandon the monitoring wells that are in that area, as well as a form of oil water separator system and trench drains that connect to it. The monitoring wells, the trench drains, and the oil water separator system will be grouted in place. And prior to that, to the backfilling them with grout, they'll be cleaned and pumped out. Um, that's just a kind of a, a, a brief description of uh, the activities that are we're going to have to execute um, in order to uh, stay in compliance with the with the uh, agreement that we have with EPC. Um, we have a contract that's a five-year contract, as you as you stated before, Madam, Madam Chair, with two one-year options. As you all probably know, environmental investigations can be extremely dynamic in nature, and so um, what we try, what we or what we are doing with this particular approach is is to manage the project from a life cycle perspective. And so what we've done is we've, we've taken a five-year outlook and uh, again there's large parts moving parts of this that are unknown but we've attempted to at least try to earmark resources and quantify uh, what we believe we will have to do over the next five years some of these are straightforward alc1 is very straightforward we're in we're in a monitoring stage there's not really much for us to do alc2 is a, is a complete question mark AOC 3, it's, it's done, it's over. We just need to do a couple of housekeeping matters to, to get it done. Um, but again, the, the aim with the way that this contract is structured um, is, is, is a way, the, what we're trying to do is, is, is manage it from, instead of managing from one point in time, managing across a life cycle. So we, we're treating it like a, like a capital project, to be honest with you. Um, and we, where we've budgeted for five years and we've, we've said this is what we're going to commit to this to these issues with the hope of being able to close out all of these areas um, in the next five years. And at this time, any questions? What percentage of the funding will come from the State Patrolling Fund? Do you have any guesstimate on that? Um, I can tell you, well, 100% of what, of the quarterly monitoring is coming from the state funding as far as the, the value of that we originally had that value around a hundred thousand dollars or so um, from, from a you know and that's monitoring on a quarterly basis and then reporting as well as well as um, uh, in some of the areas in ALC one there is some active uh, pumping that goes on we have uh, some free product in, 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 a, in one of our wells and so that well gets pumped out as free product accumulates which is kind of outside of the quarterly management portion of it um, but um, it is my understanding um, that the uh, the state uh, essentially is going to come in and handle take that away from us at this point um, the, the, the the site has a low priority score um, it's a score of 10 and because of that uh, funding was not available to us um, so we were just kind of doing what you know what we were doing uh, but recently and by recently I mean within the last 45 days well, we were notified by EPC that funding has indeed uh, freed up, so we're moving forward with them. Yeah, I would. Know, I mean, I would push for funding, and I would use the, you know, any sort of contacts you have, because I, I mean, there's money there, and I think it's something that has to be done clearly. So the more money you can get from other parties means more money for us to use on other projects. Absolutely. Um, EPC has actually already sent us a site access agreement, which is the first step in getting a third-party contractor hired through the state to come out and, and begin to work the facility. So we're, we're moving in that direction, definitely. Right. Any other comments? Um, the only question I had, or comment <laughs> question, I guess, um, when we do the heavy uh, building, heavy maintenance building um, remediation, um, is and I think the AOC two is the area of most yes, concern. Um, is there any uh, possibility that that's going to impact some of the areas that we're renovating? That's a very good question. It's something that uh, staff and we have talked about uh, round and about time and time again. Um, <coughs> to answer your question, no. Um, the improvements that we are doing um, at the HM building are not subsurface. We're not breaking the concrete slab. We're not doing any subsurface work. Um, when the time comes, 
to remediate, which we don't know what that means. We don't know if that's going to be a dig and haul, in which we would have to crack the slab, or if that's going to be something where we just do a, a natural monitoring, uh, natural attenuation monitoring, where we're, we're not actively remediating anything. However, if indeed we were to have to, down the line, do a dig and haul, where we do have to do some slab work, um, the, the upgrades that we're doing or the renovations that we're doing at HM do not affect the slab and are not doing anything with the floor. In fact, um, staff has been very adamant about, uh, they, they actually do want to do some things, but we're, we're kind of waiting to see this part first, obviously, before we, before we do it. So to answer your question at this point in time, no. Okay, very good. Okay, um, do approval. Any second? Second. Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 <clears throat> Okay, the uh, next on our agenda is a discussion item. Um, some of y'all may have seen the um, article in the Tribune. Oh, um, there was an article in the Tribune that discussed um, public agencies paying for uh, news stories. And this kind of, to me, went into um, some questions that I had over the summer where we were wanting to discuss our marketing budget and why we had seen such a, a large increase from FY14. So um, I had asked uh, if staff could kind of give us uh, a slight presentation on our current marketing budgets and, and uh, with, the, with the idea of maybe later on getting informed and, and possibly we may need to come up with some policies. But right here is just maybe to find out what's going on with our marketing efforts. So, Mr. Rosenstock? Yeah, sure. Um, again, going with um, our CEO's uh, mantra to be a change agent, a transportation agency of choice, and um, employer of choice. Actually, in April, and, and with the changing media landscape to digital advertising, we went towards digital advertising. Now, the one thing to remember is that 40% of our riders right now do not have smartphones and do not have access to tablets. So we're still talking about 60% of our car ridership. So we decided to go with a digital campaign. A digital campaign, what it does is it gives us access to immediate results. So we're able to massage it, and there are different ways to buy it on a cost per thousand basis and a cost per click. A cost per click being something that you have up as an ad and you have engagement. And there's also retargeting where the ad is up there and it will follow you follow you around on your smartphone and or tablet. And usually after three times, if you're not engaged, it'll drop off. Now there's also another way to do it too. It's called native art of content articles. And then there's also um, advertorials. Advertorials actually mention your name where a native article is about a suggested topic. Um, we did that with ABC uh, Digital and also Scripps Network put together. And what they did is they offered native content articles. So we suggest, let's say, hurricanes or safety, and we place adjacencies. Obviously, editorial adjacencies, the more interested you are in the article, the more likely you are to click on an ad about it. And um, we do buy it on a cost per thousand basis, and also, again, a cost per click. So in April, we started a new campaign called Hard Takes You There, which is an umbrella campaign, and it's aimed at three different targets. One is our current riders, which the, the theme out of the money goes towards. It's adults 18 to 49, emphasis on 18 to 44, 49% African American, and that comes from our um, local routes and um, our onboard survey from last year. And uh, we, we didn't really go after commuters. The second one would be commuters, and that's basically if you take out the um, streetcar ridership, it's about 1.7% of our current ridership right now. And the third target were influencers, and the things that we're doing, which actually goes with the change agent. What, what is new and brand new that you are doing? So there are three different separate targets. Now the way to look at each, each medium is who is the target that you're reaching? What is from ABC Digital Network, which offers the native advertising content? and also digital advertising, and then also one from 83 degrees. 83 degrees would be towards that other target, the leaders, the influencers, and um, innovation, and things that we're doing. And the ABC Scripps Network 
we can actually form into anything we want. We can, um, you're buying an audience. So we bought it based upon adults, 18 to 44, household <coughs> income less than 25,000, as our, our bulk market ship is. And the messages are crafted differently to each. And um, when we set up the advertising. Um, what we found with 83 degrees is that we had a cost per thousand ranging from 40 to 60 dollars per month, whereas the cost per thousand on the ABC Action News range from about two dollars to about 11 or 12 dollars. So it's a cost per thousand, and that's more of an awareness generator. Now, this month in October with ABC Digital Network and Scripps Network, we're changing to a cost per click. And again, it's still experimenting and seeing what we're doing and how we're performing. Because actually, some things, we want engagement. We want people to be more engaged. So we're going to start looking at the cost per clicks and setting benchmarks, even though we have benchmarks on cost per clicks also. We did engage also the iHeart Media and Google AdWords for um, one bus away. And in the month of April, it, um, blew the numbers out of the water for one bus away engagement. And we just repeated it again in September, which we had a 56% increase from August to September in the number of users. So there are instances where we can't tell directly on ridership or what happens, and that's more image. But there are some times that, like a one bus away, that we can directly affect it. And in the past, we never bought really television because um, production's expensive and placement's expensive. We used to do radio, so that's why we went with iHeartRadio and also Google Ad Network, which also is Google Phrases. So we also are using that um, in, in the future. And then we also engaged WFLA and the Lynn uh, Digital Network, and we just recently did that for the Burnett Park Live. And we bought those by zip codes and also by demographics, <laughs> and those results should be in, um, in the end of October, beginning of November. So basically, as I create a spreadsheet that, that shows the amount of money spent, the cost, um, the number of impressions that we bought versus achieved, and ABC Scripps Network is um, definitely over-delivered by 50%. And also, I, I, I track the number of impressions, the cost per thousand, the cost per click, the number of clicks, and the click-through rates. So there's a lot of metrics going on in there with different target audiences and different messages going out, and they're not um, cannibalizing each other or crossing each other. So they are pretty much pure. Yes, ma'am. That's right. I'm looking at this um, monthly information report. Oh. I put it on. So is it correct to say that it's $90 on a cost per click for um, 83 degrees and $4.74 for ABC? Correct. That's a very expensive cost per Absolutely. click program. And Absolutely. I'm not sure if 83 degrees, I mean, I know 83 degrees, you know, I get all these services on my computer, but you have 22 clicks, mm -hmm. and you said it's to affect influencers? Yes. That's what we were told, yes. That that told by who? By 83 degrees that that was wrong. Okay, we need to validate their their reach, and I think you need to look at other, I mean, I, my whole point, I, I find it amazing, and the other fact you said was that only 40% of our riders have digital access. 60% is 40% of them. Don't, and that's been, how is that, how's that validated? Because every other, I mean, every article you read, any, you know, say that 87 to 95% of, of the population in America has some sort of a good phone. Yeah, this was validated last year when we did an onboard survey. We specifically asked questions. Mm -hmm. And we did ask, do you have a tablet? Do you, do you use a tablet? Do you use a smartphone? Do you have a regular <coughs> cell phone? And about 40% indicated they just have a regular cell phone. So there's a differentiation between a tablet, um, a laptop, um, a desktop, and also a smartphone. Okay, but they still have access to a phone, right? I mean, yes. you're not saying that. No. So you got to be very careful about the terminology around within which we talk about it. So they might have a slow phone, as you might call it, versus a smartphone, but they have access to a phone. 
right? Yes, but you would not be able to advertise on it. And you, you could not text be able on to it. <clears throat> I mean, I have an 85 year old grant. My mom is 85 years old and she carries a flip phone. Mm -hmm. And she can get texts. She can't get anything else. It'll blow up if it got anything else. But so understanding the dynamic around within which the audience that we work with, I think you have to talk very clearly about, you know, when we use facts like that, because I. I mean, I read a lot of information about social media, and I do a very aggressive ways it relates to my own company on this. And um, this is a very expensive cost per click program that you have ongoing with 83 degrees. And I don't know if there's a time and term around that, or you do it on a monthly basis, but I would say you're not getting your reach in terms of that cost. That's extraordinary in today's marketplace. Director Shanahan, to, um, to respond to two different points. First, you are correct. We found that um, our four-month engagement with 83 mm -hmm. Degrees was $8,000. It concluded September 30th. And based on the information and the usage, uh, our marketing team does not recommend we continue with that. It was a valuable benchmark, uh, and we've seen the usage. And we will be moving on to look at other, other venues. To amplify Steve's answer regarding social media, our survey found about 45% of our patients have <laughs> smartphones. But another 40% said they just had cell phones. Some held up their smartphone and said, oh yeah, I've just gotten a cell phone. Some held up, you know, a tin can to a piece of string, essentially. So we do know that 80 some odd percent have phone access, positively at least 40 odd of smartphones. Uh, and we did expand out last year with one of us away from text messaging to get our toes in the water, seeing which of our patients were receptive to us pushing content to them on that. But that is an, an excellent observation within our uh, our demographic and our market. You're always on the run. You must connect. So we do find a lot of phone access, uh, but we did see some cross pollination. One of the things also to remember is that the getting leaders and influencers and CEOs, it is a more expensive target. So, like for the Tampa Bay Business <laughs> Journal, we could look into the cost per thousand also as a planning cost, and they were over a hundred dollars as well. So it's a very narrow, not a cost per click because we don't have experience with it, but just on a cost per thousand basis. We don't, we would not know what the clicks would be. And um, at this point, there is no intention to go out. And so if anybody's around here, to use that for your There's also validators in terms of who actually reads these, are these different mediums. And so I, I'm sure you, you validated what the, seller told you vis-a-vis -vis 83 right. degrees versus TBBJ or whatever. Totally independent. Yes, ma'am. Anyone else um, care to comment? I have, I have one other thing. Sure. On the peer social media section, <coughs> I mean, uh, as much as we can drive people to traffic, so, you know, you want to get people to Facebook like you, you want to get people to understand uh, blogging, tweeting, whatever, because that's where eventually you'll be able to notify them of alerts, whether it's the bus is running late, the bus is on time, one stop away, I mean, all those. And so all that should be promoted and engaged. Like I saw, we did that thing with the bicycles out at USF. I mean, if at the end of every tagline, it should be, please like us on Facebook, please register, you know, whatever we can attract them so that our number, which is second in the region, but it's still pretty small. We only have 4,000 people that have Facebook liked us. Um, in this day and age, there should be, I mean, this is one of these KPIs, you know, from my perspective, if I were running part, <laughs> would be an indicator of movement. You know, you gotta, you gotta measure it to know that it's happening, and then you gotta measure it month over month and make sure that it's increasing. Yeah, actually, to your point, Dr. Shanahan, what we've done is on the website, um, on the new website, we do have a promotional carousel. And we do put things up on there, and we are measuring them, how many engagements have crossed through. Um, we're putting promotions up there, like Burnett Park and I. Um, we're putting, we just had um, Streetcar Fest up there. So there is that ability <laughs> now to track that on the backside, and we're very excited about that. So it, it is being not only in media, but it is also within our own units. And we should show this in our monthly information update, the month over month, in terms of progress made along with some of these metrics. Yes, actually the marketing services department will be taking over in the next um, board packet, will be taking over the metrics for the website. Great. Okay, um, yeah, I had a couple uh, areas. One is the more <laughs> micro 
micro level, when when we pay for a click, what are, where are they clicking and going to? It, it goes to a link to our website and or information. For example, um, one of when we did um, in October, we're doing public private partnerships, and that link will be going to our procurement <coughs> department in information about how you can be a public private, um, um, how we can have a relationship. Um, it'll also go to Burnett Park and Ride. Um, sometimes, sometimes like Streetcar Fest, Streetcar Fest will, will link to the Streetcar website and or a PDF that we, we create that'll be informational. So it is going to something that we do control. So uh, currently, <coughs> so we just did the four month engagement with 83 Degrees Correct. and we've decided not to move forward on that. Correct. Are we, so we're currently spending 5,700 a month with Scripps ABC? <coughs> Correct. And do we have any other of this type of marketing? Yes, we also have um, WFLA and Lynn Digital. And that's probably about, we just did the $2,000 one because that was Burnett Park and Ride. It was more zip code and it was it was smaller than audience. And we're trying to influence, obviously, with our, our Megabus right. partnership. Um, we just did one with WFLA and Digital with the streetcar. So even though that streetcar, we're still able to look at the metrics as well. Uh, iHeart Media and um, iHeart Media and Google AdWords. We can. We are going to continue because we still see the best results from them, and that's probably because our main medium used to be radio, and it really they really pull for us. So um, again, this is all new. This is all benchmarking, and these are longer term campaigns where we're able to afford and actually get results and able to target. The one thing about um, iHeart Media, which was really good with the one bus away is they, they're able to also optimize. We start out with a general. Um, we give them direction as to who we want to reach, not only demographic, but psychographic. And what they're able to do is, since we did One Bus Away in April, we get their results, and we're able to start from where we ended off, and go back in September, and actually get better results, and narrow the target to who that we're going to, even with the same amount of impressions, so the quality of the audience that we are buying is actually better than when we started in April. It's a constantly going in um, and looking at the results, comparing them, and making sure that we're getting the best and more effective and efficient buys that we possibly can on the back end. And when we can, we try to look at <laughs> the front end and what it's doing to ridership. Um, one of the things is like commuters. Um, we're going to see if we can influence commuters. We had a native article on commuting and the ease of commuting. And um, I have the results of that. But again, does it affect ridership? We're not sure. That, that'll take a while to do and go. What, what, would, uh, what is our, our total? F so in FY16 in our budget, we had marketing and printing kind of combined. Mm -hmm. How much of that is marketing and how much is printing? Printing is about 40% of the budget, and the budget is about Half a million? 378. 378. Yeah, the full marketing and uh, pardon me, Madam Chairman, the full marketing and printing line that creates all printing within the agency. And while we've seen decrease in paper, we're still transitioning that. Mm -hmm. So this aggregate number includes all the paperwork, the mm -hmm. triplicate forms, and, and mark, uh, maintenance, front end work where we're green sheeting the buses and includes all the paperwork, we do the operated bids, that we are, the COO is leading an effort to get us to an app-based format so we can get rid of a lot of that paper, but our budget does include all the agency printing. So the 650 in the budget, about 300,000 is full printing, and again, we'll get that cost down as we go through for further iterations. About 350 comes back to the marketing department itself. And, and on the marketing printing, the marketing printing has actually gone down by 50% than it did from three years ago. And just recently also, like our schedule books, which cost a lot of money, they're about $8,000. I just cut the 20% uh, the number. Um, our new one for December, um, I cut the quantities by, by about 20%. Because also, we're looking at a total revamp also of the schedule book this year in taking out pages, things that don't necessarily need to be in a full book and just have it as schedules and just an explaining it. So that should cut down on a lot of the printing as well. So we're constantly monitoring the costs and the numbers and the quantities that we're looking at. 
So if, if 350000 is our marketing budget, I, I would like to um, spend some time maybe in a future meeting looking at how that impacts our ridership and our fare mm -hmm. revenue. Because in a private business, we're not going to put that much in our marketing budget unless we get a return. And I think a lot of, um, I, I've, we probably do do this, but I know one of the articles that was written was about hurricane preparedness. <laughs> And I would um, think that we would do a better service to our customers who are the ones that are, you know, the ones dependent on transit are the ones that are going to need to know that information. You know, can we have brochures, you know, on the buses for, you know, okay, we do. Um, so I'm just trying to look at ways where we can, you know, use our dollars towards service or building our ridership. And... You know, one and having a and having a message, you know, the thing I have with you know these types of um, advertising campaigns like that was in the paper, we don't really control the message, and if we, you know, I would rather put that money into a commercial where we know the message and we, you know, we have you know a specific thing we want to say rather than you know anything on transportation is okay. You know, I think we would want to have control yes. over that message. Yes, and actually that's the beauty of ABC and Scripps Network where we're able to do a uh, content marketing. Our content article made of content because we control or we suggest heavily suggest as was quoted in the paper heavily suggest what what we want to do um, like example private partner um, relationships a lot of that information that came from your <laughs> article comes from the ACTA website so what we do is that you know we kind of tell them what we want to do for the month and we do have like what I call an editorial board at work. Um, where the CEO, community relations, myself, uh, marketing services, and the PIO get together once a month to talk about messaging to make sure that we're all on the same page. Now, there's a lot of other things that we do that don't cost the taxpayer money, which is onboard flyers. We have commuter advertising, which is enunciator advertising. Um, even signal is a reduced rate, and direct media, if, if we, we retain 5% of the inventory, which is the on the bus advertising, the transit advertising for interior cards, exterior cards, and production, um, and and we've put in innovative ways. Like for example, if you want to do on, on the ceiling, advertise on the ceiling, or in non-traditional ways in the back, on the fare box, on the route schedule, on the inside. Um, there are ways to do that, and it doesn't cost. It, it hardly costs anything. So we do maximize exposure in those ways as well. Um, Ms. Egan, would there be a way that we could come back with a report of, of um, how how this type of marketing, I, I'd say our entire marketing budget, uh, what the objective is as far as ridership and our activities and our revenues? Let us line up an update from the fiscal 2016 marketing plan to include all of this information. Of putting in perspective and looking at our numbers, from 2010 to 2011, obviously there was a big shift in the marketing expenses. We are now seeing the opportunity to reinvest. We have the ability to get new services out there. We're delivering innovation, trying to make sure folks know about them. And a big focus of our marketing plan has been to respond to this. I wish I had known you had XYZ, whether it was one bus away, a commuter service. We hear our outreach. We, we, our team's do an excellent job with grassroots. We'll hit over 200 events this year. But we hear a lot from folks, I wish I had known. How can I get that information? So let us come back with an update from the 2016 plan, show how it's broken down uh, and the targets. And we'll also come back with a, a three-year trend on what we have seen and where we were able to spend money and what, how that's guiding the decisions that we're making now. Bearing in mind, obviously, this is taxpayer money. And balancing, do we put the money in an extra hour of service? Do we put the money in the outreach to tell folks what they could be doing with the hours which are already on? on the ground to make sure we, we, we walk you through that process. Anybody else have any comments on this or anything else? Seeing none, um, thank you all for being here and we are adjourned.